So good morning and uh, welcome to our second lecture of systems. Uh, today and uh, next week we'll be talking about sensors for humidity and uh, pressure. I will start with sensors for humidity and uh, then uh, at the end of the lecture, let's say second half, uh, we'll be talking about pressure sensors. We'll be talking about uh, pressure sensors that are used to calibrate all other instruments and uh, then in the following lecture we'll be talking about uh, industrial grade uh, pressure sensors. So uh, let's uh, take a look on the humidity sensors first. Uh, we first need to define humidity, how we will be measuring it and how we'll be expressing the humidity. Uh, we will have two kinds of uh, humidity. Uh, we will have uh, absolute humidity and then relative humidity. Uh, absolute humidity uh, will give us the content of uh, water in uh, units of weight per some given volume. So uh, you can imagine it as uh, if we would be able to measure the weight of some water content let's say in a cube meter and uh, we will look for how many kilograms or how many grams of uh, water we have uh, in this volume. So obviously the units uh, for absolute humidity will be kilograms per cube meter. Uh, we will use this symbol to uh, express uh, the absolute humidity so it's a uh, phi prime. Uh, however, uh, the sensors that I will show you today, they do not uh, measure directly uh, absolute humidity because uh, this is a quite hard task to do. And uh, in most cases, uh, we want to get uh, the relative humidity. A relative humidity is uh, the content of uh, water vapors if you compare it to the maximal humidity so saturated air now for some reason here this uh, will just uh, go back to my presentation and I will just erase this yellow stuff which should be the highlighting but uh, uh, for some reason it uh, covered the, the text uh, so uh, the relative humidity uh, will depend on temperature in the very least and uh, we'll see that uh, we will use this dependence uh, later also for sensing of relative humidity. So relative humidity is a percentage between 0 and uh, 100%. And uh, we compare the current humidity to the humidity that uh, we would have in the saturated air. Uh, we will also need to define uh, what is the dew point because uh, the very first sensor will take uh, advantage of this dew point measurement. So the dew point is the temperature and pressure at which a gas begins to condensate into a liquid. So uh, it is temperature so in centigrade so we can say that the dew point is uh, for example 10 centigrades or or uh, minus 5 centigrade something something like this uh, there is a video that uh, you can take a look uh, later in, on this link uh, that explains uh, the difference between the dew points and uh, the humidities I think uh, it should be clear from this explanation so humidity is uh, the water content either in, in kilograms per cubic meter or relative humidity but the dew point is uh, temperature. So let's take a look on uh, how we can actually measure uh, humidity. The first sensor that we will discuss uh, is called a chilled mirror hygrometer or it's also called a dew point hygrometer and the principle is quite simple you can see an example here in winter when you have a window 
then uh, the window if it's cold outside the window is cold the glass is has a low temperature especially in the corners of the window and uh, in the room inside you have a higher temperature and you have a higher relative humidity but as the air is uh, touching the surface of the glass it will decrease its temperature and uh, its temperature will drop below the dew point so dew starts to form on the surface of the glass so you can see here those uh, water droplets on the glass and this is exactly the principle of a dew point hygrometer we have a surface here it's a mirror and on this surface we will be detecting if uh, we have some water droplets or not now there are several ways how you can actually detect uh, the water droplets uh, you can detect it with uh, capacitive changes or impedance changes uh, on this picture it is shown as an optical system so here we have the gas where we want to measure the humidity this could be the air we need to provide some gas flow so uh, there will be a fan and uh, we are looking at the reflection from our mirror so now if uh, we will have the temperature of the mirror above the dew point temperature it will look like this there will be no dew on uh, the mirror itself and we will have a fairly good reflection as soon as uh, there will be the water droplets on the surface it will look like this and we will have uh, the different reflection it will still still reflect something but uh, the reflection will be much smaller so what we try to do is to detect uh, the reflection from the mirror for this reason we are not looking for the let's say absolute reflection how much does it reflect but we want to compare that with some reference beam and the reference beam is uh, directly the beam going from some light source which is shown in here so this is the light source and uh, the, the detectors so what we are doing is uh, we're doing a relative measurements between a reference beam that is going directly from the light source to the detector and between the measuring beam that is going through the mirror so there if there is no dew we have a fairly good reflection and uh, the measuring beam and the reference beam will basically be the same of course there will be some very small attenuation uh, on the mirror surface but uh, it will be only very small and at the end we have two detectors and we compare how much light is uh, coming from the reference beam and how much light is coming from the measuring beam so if there is no dew there is basically no difference between those two signals now we use an amplifier to amplify the difference and the signal from the amplifier is then going to a control system so a control block now this could be a microprocessor for example and this control block uh, reads the signal from the amplifier but uh, it will also be able to control the temperature of my mirror so the mirror is uh, placed on a, a heater and cooler and uh, I can control the power to this heater and cooler so I can turn on the heating or I can turn on the cooling and uh, since uh, we are looking for the dew point we need a temperature sensor so here we have some temperature sensor it could be a PT100 or a thermistor for example uh, something it needs to be something quite accurate so in, in most cases it will be like a PT100 and uh, the temperature is also going into the control system so what is the control system doing well, it is uh, periodically changing the temperature of my mirror. So if I would plot uh, the uh, temperature versus time dependence, 
uh, we will be able to, to see what's going on. So it's looking something like this. Here we have time and here we have temperature of my mirror. So I start at some temperature that uh, is uh, above the dew point temperature or let's say above the last known dew point temperature. And now I start cooling this mirror. So if I look uh, on the temperature, it will certainly be some transient response. So let's say a transient response of first order, something like this, an exponential. Uh, now uh, I will be detecting what is uh, the difference between my reference beam and between my measuring beam. So if I look uh, on uh, the reflection, let's plot it uh, with a different color, so for example green one. So here this will be the intensity of my reflection, so let's call it I. Now of course it will have different units, but uh, I will start somewhere again, so here this is uh, where I have some uh, some intensity and uh, as soon as the temperature drops below the dew point then I will start the water droplets I will see the water droplets on the mirror so the intensity at some point will drop like that and uh, from this I can say, say okay uh, sorry I just double clicked so now from this point I can say okay now this would be my dew point temperature so uh, from the dew point temperature I can uh, find out what uh, will be the humidity content uh, there are equations for that uh, so that you can relate the dew point temperature to uh, the original humidity that you had in the air uh, now this cycle uh, will actually repeat so uh, here I will increase the temperature again above some temperature above the dew point temperature uh, and uh, obviously here the, the intensity will again rise and uh, then I will have some intensity so uh, this control unit is uh, repeating the cycle so it means that it's periodically heating and cooling this mirror uh, we can use for example a Peltier element to do this because with a Peltier element you can easily have heating and cooling you simply reverse the direction of the current so this power block will provide you few amperes few volts and you just uh, simply reverse the polarity and this will give you heating and cooling so this is working in a cycle um, so it takes some time before we can uh, we can get uh, the correct reading from our humidity uh, the time constant uh, obviously depends on the setup here but uh, it will be somewhere from few seconds to few minutes it depends on the size of the mirror and uh, on the heat capacity uh, of uh, our assembly so if it's a, like a small mirror a uh, small heater then it will heat uh, and cool uh, more quickly so the period that we see here this period between the measurement uh, this uh, will be from few seconds to few minutes so this is not a continuous measurement however it is uh, a quite accurate measurement the dew point hygrometers are one of the more most uh, accurate hygrometers uh, that you can find uh, let's say in the in the industry now uh, as i was already saying you don't need to do this just uh, with uh, an optical system so what you can see here in this example is uh, the chilled mirror hygrometer where uh, the capacitive sensing is used and we can see the setup over there so here is uh, a heater and cooler so this uh, is a heat sink that uh, takes away the heat that we have 
this white square is uh, the Peltier couple that is used uh, for heating and cooling and uh, this is uh, the electrode assembly that we will see in a minute you can see it here on the right side and uh, basically the, the let's say call it test chamber is, uh, is this small area so uh, you heat and cool down the sample of uh, a gas that you have in this test area now what is inside now inside we can see this uh, cross-sectional view you can see that uh, they made it as a silicon chip and uh, in here they have uh, some heater so it's uh, directly heated by the electrical current in here you can see thermal resistor so this is our temperature sensor that uh, gets the temperature and uh, on top of, of this we have uh, they call that an impedance detector so they have detected uh, the changes of electrical impedance when there is dew and when there is no dew on the surface now under the microscope it looks like this you can see it's uh, like a grid uh, of uh, electrodes and uh, when um, you, you imagine this as a capacitor for example then uh, when you add some drops above uh, the uh, the um, electrodes like that somewhere then uh, obviously the capacity and hence also the impedance uh, will change we can see here uh, some examples uh, they have uh, given in in their paper which is uh, referenced here and uh, without any dew you can see it looks like this so no water droplets at all on the surface and uh, as uh, the water content is increasing you can see we have more and more water droplets and uh, this will give us the changes of electrical impedance so let's take a look on how uh, such a, a device may look like if you uh, are looking for an industrial version uh, here I have uh, three different examples but uh, they work on the same principle so every time there is some system that detects uh, the dew point uh, in this case it uh, is an optical system in this case uh, it's, well, it's also an optical system I don't know about, about this one but uh, we can check it out here on this, on this on this link so it's mostly optical systems although other systems exist as well you can see here we have uh, the you know, light source and detector so this is the producing light here we have the mirror that uh, reflects uh, the, uh, the, the light back and uh, on the mirror will be well on the detector will be detecting uh, no, sorry on the mirror will be detecting uh, the, the dew here and uh, here we see some connections like this pipe and this pipe uh, to connect the sample uh, of my gas uh, and uh, to guide it uh, into this small chamber so obviously uh, they will be heating and cooling this mirror uh, we can see a similar system here so now although this looks different uh, it is the same principle uh, it looks uh, very similar to the one we have seen uh, on this on this paper so heatsink then a system for detection and cooling uh, and uh, that th all this uh, forms then some chamber uh, where you have the sample so here we can see the heatsink here uh, we can see the chamber and now this is the optical cavity uh, so obviously this is uh, using the optical system so uh, if we look on uh, some data sheets uh, we'll find out that uh, this is quite an accurate system uh, on the other hand uh, it will be also quite expensive uh, we don't have uh, such a chilled mirror hygrometer in our labs uh, the cost is somewhere around um, let's say 5000 euros roughly so it's uh, something that's, uh, that is quite expensive uh, we'll see the properties uh, later when we will compare the different uh, principles for hygrometers now let's uh, talk about the second principle 
uh, that uh, will help us to measure humidity. Uh, this is also based on temperature measurements, but uh, it's uh, using uh, something, some other principle. Uh, it is called a sling psychrometer. Now, it is called a sling psychrometer because if you use it, you will see in, in a minute, you hold it in your hand and uh, you sling it and uh, this provides you the airflow. Or you could uh, use a fan to provide the airflow. Anyway, you need some airflow uh, for this. To work correctly. So how does it work? Well we have two thermometers. We have one thermometer that we will call a dry thermometer and this dry thermometer measures the temperature of uh, dry air. Well it's not dry but uh, it measures the temperature of our sample. So this airflow flows around both but uh, we measure the temperature here with the dry thermometer. The second is called a wet thermometer because uh, it is measuring the temperature of uh, air that is saturated to 100%. So in order to saturate the air, we need some source of water. So you have a water tank like this or it can be like a small water tank, nothing, nothing large. And uh, you wrap a cloth, piece of cloth around your thermometer. Now, uh, since here we have airflow and uh, water here, now obviously the water will evaporate and uh, it will take away heat from my air. So this means that uh, the wet thermometer will give me a lower temperature. And that's what we are looking for. We are looking for the temperature of uh, the dry air and the temperature difference. And from those two variables, we can get through an equation or a chart or a table we can get what was the original relative humidity of uh, my sample. So let's take a look on such a, such a chart. So this chart or this table it's called a psychrometric chart or psychrometric table and it's looking like that. And from the psychrometric chart if we have uh, the temperature difference and uh, the dry, it's called dry bulb temperature, it's the dry thermometer temperature, then we can get uh, what is the relative humidity. So let's say that we would make an experiment in the lab. Let's say uh, we would have uh, the dry bulb temperature equal to, let's say, 20 centigrades. So we would be somewhere here. This is the dry bulb temperature. So I'm following uh, this uh, vertical line and uh, let's say that uh, our temperature difference uh, or wet bulb temperature uh, would be let's say 5 centigrades temperature difference. So this means that wet bulb is uh, 15 centigrades. Uh, sometimes in the tables uh, you will find directly the wet bulb temperature or uh, in some other tables you may find uh, the temperature difference. So in this chart we have directly the temperature that we read uh, from the wet thermometer. I was saying 15, so it's, it's this line. And this means that uh, I'm at this point and this gives me 60% of uh, relative humidity. So this measurement is fairly simple. You can do it with uh, any two thermometers. So uh, you could you can do it also with glass thermometers, with mercury, or with some other liquid. Uh, in industrial applications, uh, you could do it uh, with, uh, for example, a PT100 sensor. So uh, this does not limit uh, 
what kind of temperature sensor you use you can use basically anything that measures your temperature so it's a fairly simple to do it uh, although it has uh, one uh, disadvantage now the disadvantage is uh, coming from the fact that we need to have this wet thermometer wet so uh, we need some small water tank uh, we need to keep the water in it so we need to maintain it it's not working just on its own and uh, here we see evaporation of my water so it will contaminate my sump so for this reason this slink psychrometer is uh, fine if you have uh, larger volumes where you measure the humidity for example if you measure the humidity in a room then it's completely fine because uh, although you will increase very slightly the humidity in uh, the room it, it will not change that much but uh, if you would have a, an enclosed space, I don't know, 10 cube centimeters, for example, then uh, this would uh, evaporate the humidity and uh, would uh, significantly change the humidity that you measure at the end. So how does it look like? Well, typically it looks like this. That's why it's called a sling psychrometer. Uh, you hold this in your hand you turn it and this slings round like this so you rotate this stuff you can see this in this animation how uh, how this is uh, used and uh, you can see that at the end uh, we have this is the tank of uh, my water so it's a piece of cloth that's uh, uh, wet typically with distilled water and uh, we hold it in a hand and we rotate it like this and uh, this rotation uh, will provide us the airflow and we can see here that uh, the dry bulb temperature measures directly the temperature of my air and uh, the wet bulb temperature measures uh, some lower temperature uh, because uh, here uh, the water is evaporating and it's taking away the heat from it so it's a fairly simple device you can see here th those uh, psychrometers they use uh, the um, glass thermometers uh, with some uh, ethanol probably that uh, has been painted in red uh, it can be used with, with any type of uh, temperature sensor so you can easily build it uh, as far as you provide uh, the airflow uh, for example in this case uh, here let me just move my head a little bit so in this case here uh, we see a fan and this fan provides airflow around those two thermometers and uh, one of them will have the piece of cloth I believe is this one and uh, we soak it in water we turn the fan we wait until we have a steady reading so there will be some temperature like that and uh, some temperature like this <coughs> and uh, we read uh, the temperatures and we use the psychrometric chart to get uh, the uh, relative humidity so uh, it is a fairly simple principle uh, you can uh, get uh, the humidity within a few percent of accuracy and uh, you can use any other kind of temperature sensor to actually get uh, the reading so it can be in, in industrial sensors it might be a thermistor it might be a PT100 for example okay and uh, the last humidity sensor uh, will be called just a hygrometer uh, if you want to be more specific uh, you can uh, name the material which is uh, AL203 so uh, sometimes uh, this is called a dry electrolyte uh, hygrometer and this device will be able to give us an electrical signal so if you have uh, a psychrometer you need to read somehow the temperatures if you read uh, the if you use the, the temperature sensors 
such as uh, RTDs, then you can get uh, the, the signal as well. But uh, this one gives you directly the electrical signal. And the principle is very simple. Uh, we have some material, this is the electrolyte, it's typically an aluminum oxide. And uh, when this material absorbs uh, humidity, it will change its uh, electrical properties. So it will change capacity and electrical resistance. And we can simply measure those two properties and uh, they will be uh, related somehow to humidity. So we make basically a capacitor out <coughs> from this material. So we need two electrodes. Uh, one electrode is uh, made from aluminium and uh, this is uh, a non-porous electrode and uh, the other electrode needs to be porous. So here we need some holes no, no, red, red idea is, red color is not a good idea so uh, here we need to have some hole, small holes so that uh, the water vapor can actually enter into our electrolyte. Uh, so here you can see two microscope photographs. Uh, the picture A is uh, the non-porous electrode, so this is the aluminium one on the bottom. And uh, on top here you can see the gold electrode and you can see this honeycomb structure. And uh, through those small openings, uh, the water can enter in the electrolyte and can change its properties. You can see approximately the dimensions here. Uh, so um, it's uh, about 50 nanometers, uh, roughly the, the whole size. So it's something that's very, very thin. So we're looking for the capacity or electric resistance of my electrolyte. Now aluminium is conductive and uh, gold obviously as well. So basically this will be a capacitor like that. And uh, this will be one electrode. And uh, this will be my second electrode. So uh, what will I see if I measure capacity and uh, resistance? Uh, we'll see mm, something like this. Uh, of course, it depends uh, on the material and, and so on. But basically, what you are say, seeing is uh, that here we have the resistance. And uh, this is my curve over there. So this is curve for the resistance. And uh, this is uh, the curve for capacitance. And on the x-axis, uh, we have uh, relative humidity. So when we are increasing relative humidity, we can see that electrical resistance is decreasing. We can see that this is a nonlinear decrease, but we can have this stored as a table, for example. And uh, the capacity is first increasing like that. Well, that's uh, clear because uh, the relative uh, perma permittivity of uh, water is about 88 for room temperature <coughs> and, uh, and so the capacity will increasing and uh, then when we are above some point we can see here it's saturated and uh, the capacity is uh, not changing anymore so uh, what we can actually do is that we can combine those two variables and uh, we can get a sensor that will work in a full range. You can see here that capacity, okay, it would work fine in this region, hopefully. So around very small relative humidity. On the other hand here, uh, this, uh, if it would continue, it would be flat like that. So here we have a very small sensitivity. But uh, the resistive uh, sensing can be quite good in this area. So we can combine the capacitive and resistive sensing and uh, this will give us the 
full range of humidity from 0 to 100 percent. You can see approximately the values that we need to measure. So in terms of resistance, it's uh, hundreds of kilo ohms roughly, around 100 kilo ohms. And uh, in terms of capacity, it's around uh, one nanofarad. So it's fairly small, but uh, uh, still this is uh, possible to measure. Uh, the accuracy that you get typically from this kind of hygrometer is uh, within a few percent. So it may be 3%, it may be 5%, it may be 2%. Uh, it really depends on the type, how it's made. And uh, also it depends on uh, if you even need to measure humidity with 2% uh, accuracy. It might be too expensive, so you say, okay, now I will be fine in, in using a sensor that gives me plus minus 5%. Now on the right chart here you can see the transient response of such a sensor. Uh, so here we have time and uh, at the beginning here we have made a step change of uh, humidity. Uh, so uh, when we are increasing humidity, and this is the absorption curve, now uh, the water content needs to get into the material so obviously it will take some time and uh, the same also when we decrease the ambient humidity then the humidity stored in the electrolyte needs to get away into the ambient air so uh, there will definitely be some transient response uh, we can read the time constant uh, it's not the same for absorption and desorption uh, anyway, it will be in the order of few seconds. <clears throat> so, for example, if I use this absorption curve, I make a steady state line here and uh, a tangent here at uh, the origin. So this would give me the time constant of, uh, let's say, 2.5 seconds, roughly. Uh, now, industrial sensors, uh, since they are encapsulated, <clears throat> they will have... Uh, the uh, time constant a little bit larger. These are the ones we are using in the lab. They have a time constant of around 8 seconds. Anyway, it's uh, in some units of seconds. So how does it look like? Well, uh, the sensor itself looks like this. So here under this cover, that's uh, where you have the absorption material. And now this particular type has already uh, a digital circuitry inside, so a small microcontroller. And uh, uh, you can get uh, the data out uh, on a digital bus. But uh, you can find also sensors that uh, give you some analog signal. For example, as a change of electrical resistance or, or frequency or capacity. Uh, when you then use it in an industrial system, it typically looks like this. So the sensor itself is under this cover. <coughs> so this is a, a protection. It looks like a foam. Uh, it can be a foam. It uh, can be a steel mesh, for example. Uh, so this is uh, the sensor. So something like this is in there. And uh, this is uh, placed... Uh, I guess you could call it like a thermal well, but it's not a thermal well, it's uh, something that protects the sensor from uh, mechanical damage. And uh, then this is the electronic unit that gives you temperature and humidity. Now in most cases, uh, the sensor like that uh, is uh, able to give you temperature reading as well. Uh, we have seen previously that uh, relative humidity is a function of temperature so for this reason the vast majority of uh, humidity sensors gives you temperature as well so that you can then calculate what is uh, for example absolute humidity and measure the temperature as well so at the end uh, let us talk about how we can actually calibrate uh, a hygrometer uh, it's not that difficult uh, you can calibrate uh, hygrometers uh, in a lab or at home. 
so for example if you have a hygrometer that measures uh, the humidity in a room you may find out that uh, it is not that accurate especially the really cheap ones uh, for example uh, once I was uh, comparing well, I bought like three or four hygrometers that looked like that and uh, I had them in the same place for a long time and uh, one was showing let's say 60 and the other one was showing 65 the other one was showing 58 and so on so uh, you need to calibrate uh, hygrometers if you want to get accurate measurements and uh, one way how to do it is to use uh, a saturated salt solution now the advantage of uh, this is that you can really do it uh, very simply at home because a saturated salt solution is nothing else than uh, a salt that uh, you soak with water and then you put all this into some enclosed small space so it could be a bag like this it could be like a small box and then this is your salt solution and uh, this is your hygrometer and uh, you can see here uh, for example sodium chloride which is nothing else than table salt gives you a very good relative humidity of approximately 75% and uh, although it is dependent on temperature you can see that it's almost constant to 75% so uh, within room temperatures which will be somewhere around here we have a fairly good accuracy of 75 so the calibration procedure is as follows you take some salt you place that into small box you soak it with water so that it's like a paste and then you take your hygrometer and this box with the salt you put that into a container or in box and then you wait you wait for I don't know 10 hours 20 hours until you have a constant reading and then if uh, you see that uh, your hygrometer is showing 79 but you know it should be 75 then you know that you need to subtract a uh, few percent uh, to get the correct reading now some hygrometers have uh, a calibration system so uh, either a variable resistor or some screw that uh, you may turn and you may calibrate it back uh, to 75 percent uh, you can see we can use different materials uh, so that uh, we can calibrate it at several points <coughs> so for example uh, if you use potassium carbonate then you can calibrate to 43% if you use potassium sulfate you will calibrate basically to 98% so we can calibrate hygrometers at several points with a simple system <coughs> fairly accurately uh, by the way here uh, such hygrometers that you can buy anywhere uh, they will give you an accuracy of let's say plus minus five percent so uh, although they can show you 75 it's 75 plus minus five uh, or plus minus three that, that depends so uh, this type of uh, calibration is uh, good enough and uh, you can calibrate it quite well uh, there is a calibration video that you can find on the internet uh, they, they show uh, how this calibration is done and uh, it's basically the same system so at the end uh, let me compare different technologies for humidity now in this table you can see more principles we have discussed only a few of them in this lecture so we have discussed only the chilled mirror hygrometer we have discussed uh, the wet and dry bulb here so this is the psychrometer and uh, then we have discussed the capacitive one which is uh, uh, one of those three <coughs> columns here uh, the other ones we did not discuss uh, but keep in mind that uh, there are other principles that uh, you may use for humidity sensing 
So let's start with the chilled mirror hygrometer. So what does it measure? It measures dew point temperature. So humidity is calculated. It is very costly compared to the other ones. But on the other hand, it is highly accurate. Now in this table they don't show us the accuracy, but it can it can be within few percent. So let's say one percent, for example. Uh, the response time is they call it medium here. Uh, anyway, it can be somewhere from few seconds to to few minutes. That depends on uh, how it's made. So let's say hundred seconds, uh, two hundred seconds roughly. If we take a look on the psychrometer, which is uh, this column, uh, then uh, we measure temperature as well. But here we measure two temperatures, uh, the wet and dry bulb temperature. Uh, the accuracy is uh, in the order of few percent, so three to four percent roughly. The time constant is similar to the time constant of the chilled mirror hygrometer. Uh, we are heating something and then we are reading the temperature. So, uh, for example, the ones we have in the labs uh, that has about one or two minutes uh, time constant. So you need to wait this time to get the reading. And the last one uh, is the capacitive sensor. So it measures directly the uh, relative humidity. I will just use this column. So we measure relative humidity by measuring the capacity or resistance. Now in terms of cost, uh, this is uh, the lowest cost out of those three. Since uh, well, those sensors, if you buy them, it might be something like ten dollars and ten euros, uh, twenty euros, depends on the accuracy. So compared to to the chilled mirror hygrometer, it's like two orders of magnitude smaller. Uh, accuracy is uh, somewhere between one to five percent. Now again, this is price dependent. If uh, well, for example, in the labs, uh, if uh, we have a sensor that has three percent accuracy. It is about 15 euros, just the sensor itself, just, uh, just this chip. If uh, <coughs> we buy the same chip, well not the same type, but a similar looking chip from the same manufacturer that has uh, about 1.5% accuracy, then it will be like uh, double or triple price. So uh, depends on your application, whatever you need. And if it makes sense for you to really measure humidity within a few percent with a really expensive sensor. Uh, on the other hand, the response time of uh, this sensor is uh, in the order of few seconds. So in this table they say okay 15 to 60 seconds, for some type they say 4, for some type they say 8. Uh, the ones that we have in the lab uh, are about uh, 8 seconds. Uh, time for the response okay so that's all uh, for humidity sensors and now in the remaining time now we'll be discussing pressure so uh, as I was saying we'll not finish completely this presentation today uh, but we will discuss uh, just uh, the definition of pressure and then uh, calibration instruments so I think that you all know how pressure is defined. Uh, pressure is defined uh, as a force that is acting on a given area. So uh, we have a force F and uh, we apply this to some area A. And this will give us pressure. Now an equivalent definition is uh, using hydrostatic pressure. So if you have a tank with a liquid, you have uh, a liquid level H, then you can calculate what will be the pressure created by the liquid if you know the density. 
So it's density times gravitational acceleration times h. So we can use this as a definition of pressure or we can use this as a definition of pressure. So if my pressure sensor will use uh, either that or that, it uses directly the definition of pressure and uh, I can use this instrument to calibrate all other instruments. Let's take a look on units of pressure. Now we have standard SI units but uh, in, in pressure units it is uh, quite common to use other values than Pascals. So it is very useful to have at least an approximate idea about uh, how much this is in pressure. So this is just a selection. There are many more units uh, for pressure, but uh, the ones you can see here are the most uh, common ones that, uh, that you may encounter. Uh, so the basic unit of uh, pressure is Pascal based on the SI system. Uh, however, all those units are still in use and uh, you may find areas where they talk about bars, you may find areas where they talk about PSIs and so on. So one bar is uh, 100,000 Pascals. So this is very simple to remember. Now this Kp over square meter, now this stands for kilopond per square meter, and uh, this corresponds to one millimeter of uh, water column. So this is using the definition with the hydrostatic pressure. So if we have one millimeter of water column, it will give us this pressure 9.8 and something pascals. So quite small pressure but uh, you may still find gauges that are calibrated either in millimeters of water column or directly in kilopond per me square meter. Now in meteorology, for example, you may find uh, a physical atmosphere. And a physical atmosphere is defined as a pressure of uh, 101,000 325 pascals <clears throat> so roughly it's uh, equal to one bar although you can see it's about one percent larger now a very common unit is one tor and one tor is uh, defined with the hydrostatic pressure of mercury so one millimeter of mercury column will give you a pressure of uh, 133 pascals. So if you find um, some, some number saying that uh, the pressure is uh, 700 tors, then you multiply that by this constant and this will give you the uh, pressure in pascals. And uh, the last unit is uh, especially common in the US and in countries that uh, don't use the metric system PSI it's pound per square inch so we have one pound that's the force per square inch that's my area and uh, you can see here this is uh, the value of one PSI in Pascals so it's a good idea to at least have an estimate of uh, how large those units are so that uh, you can quickly uh, guess uh, what uh, the pressure is in the more common units uh, that we use in uh, an SI system. Okay, uh, what types of pressures can we measure? Well, we can measure absolute pressure or we can measure a pressure difference. Now the absolute pressure is the pressure that we would get compared to zero pressure, compared to some vacuum. So we will see that some sensors 
will give us directly the reading as an absolute pressure. And some other sensors will give us a reading as a pressure difference. So we need to have some reference and uh, this reference will be compared with uh, the measured pressure. Now very often this reference is the barometric pressure. So it is the current pressure that we have in the atmosphere. Uh, of course, the barometric pressure is variable. We, we know that uh, during the day it's changing, it's uh, changing with weather and so on. However, for many industrial purposes, we really don't care what is the barometric pressure, but uh, we are just looking what is the pressure difference compared to my barometric pressure. What we will see later and in two weeks we'll be discussing flow sensors and that's exactly the case where we are looking for a pressure difference because we can relate a pressure difference to flow that we have uh, in some pipe for example. So uh, for some re experiments uh, you will need to get the absolute pressure but for most experiments it will be quite sufficient to have a pressure difference so we measure the pressure between two points and uh, that this is what the pressure sensor will give us so we will discuss first the so-called calibration instruments now calibration instruments that means that uh, we can use those instruments to calibrate all other devices. It is also sometimes called a primary standard or in this case primary pressure standard. And uh, those instruments will use the definition of pressure. So it is either a force on an area or a hydrostatic pressure. And those instruments are used to calibrate all other instruments. Now, uh, industrial sensors that we will see next week, they are not using those definition principles. The reason for this is that those definition principles are very large. There are not robust enough for an industrial environment. So the calibration principles are used in lab-based instruments as standards and industrial instruments they will use a different principle. It's not related that much with accuracy. Uh, the industrial sensors can be accurate as well within few percent, one person for example. But uh, since they are not using the definition of, of pressure measurement, they are not used to calibrate other instruments. So today we'll be just covering the calibration instruments and uh, we'll, we'll leave the industrial sensors for next week. So let's take a look on uh, two of those calibration instruments. Now the first one that I'd like to discuss is, let me move my hat over there, uh, the first is uh, a so-called dipping bell pressure standard. Now this is using the hydrostatic pressure. It is a, a bell like this, so this is a cylinder that is hollow at the bottom, and uh, this cylinder is submerged in a tank with liquid. So here we have a tank and uh, this is my liquid level. So all this is uh, all this is a liquid. And I want to get some pressure. So I want to measure this pressure P. Now it is obvious that uh, this bell will have some weight and uh, therefore it will be attracted with gravitational force like this. So 
uh, the force, the downward force, will be a function of uh, the dimensions of my of my bell and of the material. So if I use if I call this force F E, I can calculate it based on this equation. So the A2 and A1 that's uh, related to the diameters here, so that's basically this cylinder, uh, times length, that's the length above uh, the liquid level, times density and times gravitational force. So, but, but however, this, uh, you can see, okay, uh, all is constant except the value of L, as we will see a little bit later. So we have a constant density, we assume constant gravitational force, and we have, of course, constant uh, dimensions of uh, the bell. Now I want to measure some pressure P, and I want to find out how much this pressure is. So I have a pipe connecting like this under the bell, and uh, in this picture I'm assuming that uh, the pressure P is larger than the atmospheric pressure. So he, here if I have uh, some pressure PA, then I am assuming that P is larger than PA. So we can see that, okay, now we connect some pressure and uh, this the, the gas, our sample, will fill in this area. And uh, the liquid level under the bell will be smaller and at the same time my pressure will try to push out with some force the bell from my tank and this force is nothing else than pressure times the area under the bell so this area that I have called A1 times my pressure. Now, uh, when those two forces, Fi and Fe, are in equilibrium, then I can read what is my number from some scale in here. So there is a scale, and I can read what is the current height of my bell. If I will have a larger value of P, now this will give me a larger value of L. So I can simply write that Fi equals to Fe and uh, then I can express the value of P from this equation. So it looks like this. Uh, we can see, okay, A is constant, that's not changing. Density is not changing if my temperature is not changing. Gravitational force is not changing. So all this will give me some constant that will be related to construction times the length that I read on the scale. So the dependence between the reading length and pressure is a nice linear dependence. So if we plot that in a chart, it looks like this. Here I'm increasing the value of P and uh, my value of L is increasing. So I can read it uh, as a linear dependence like that from 0 to 100% of my scale. At the end, I'm on top of the scale, but uh, I can put an additional weight on that like this on top. I will push the bell down and then I can start again with a linear dependence. And I can repeat this over and over again so that uh, I can extend the range, of course, until I have some liquid under the bell. As soon as uh, you will start to have bubbles escaping, then uh, it will stop working. But you can extend the range few times like this so uh, you can get uh, a larger range uh, of uh, P measurements. Now obviously since this is using liquids, uh, the range 
where I can use uh, it to calibrate P will be fairly small because uh, here we are limited to density uh, we are uh, limited uh, by usable dimensions of, uh, of my bell so this type of uh, pressure standard uh, will be useful for quite small pressure ranges few kilopascals but on the other hand it is uh, highly accurate you can see such device that you can find the data. Uh, they say it's uh, able to measure between 0 to 3 or 0 to 1 pascals, kilopascals, sorry. But on the other hand, the error is 0.02%, uh, uh, so it's a very accurate device. And you can see that uh, it gives you uh, an accuracy of about 10 millipascals out on this range so it is a very accurate device it looks like this this is uh, this is the bell that uh, you basically submerge in the liquid which is uh, somewhere inside so the dipping bell pressure standard is uh, suitable for very small pressures but uh, very 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 high accuracy on the other hand, the second tester that we will be talking will be suitable for very large pressure ranges. It is called a dead weight tester. It's using also directly the definition of uh, pressure. It's force on some given area. But in this case, we are using a piston and we know what is the area of my piston and we can calculate or we can set the force on this piston so it's looking like this we have a piston here is uh, the area that we are interested A and uh, we have a force coming from the bottom of the piston from some fluid this is what we want to, to measure and from top we have a second force that is created by gravity so here we have some weight that we are adding it's sitting on top of uh, the piston and uh, for this reason it's called a dead weight tester so this weight is uh, pushing down the piston like that now we can see that uh, in equilibrium F1 needs to be equal to F2. So uh, when we have uh, force F1 coming from the weight and from the weight of the piston, then it's equal to the pressure of my fluid. So what is happening in this that weight tester is uh, that we have uh, the whole system filled with some incompressible fluid like an oil for example here we have uh, the gauge that we want to test and here we have the set of weights that uh, we are adding uh, here uh, we uh, have uh, some handle and uh, some pump that uh, will allow us to pump manually and uh, to create a defined pressure under uh, this piston so the dead weight tester is to is used to calibrate uh, other instruments so uh, <coughs> here uh, we have the gauge that we are testing so we want to verify for example that uh, this gauge is giving us correct readings we connect the gauge, we open the valve, we start pumping so that we have some defined pressure and as we are increasing the pressure now this piston will rise to a specific height that is defined by some mark uh, in there. Uh, we add the weight so that we have a defined pressure 
and uh, when we are at a specific uh, mark uh, then this means that uh, the weights plus of course the piston create us some specific pressure and then we take a look on the test gauge and we say okay now this is reading correctly or it needs to be recalibrated so in practice it looks like this this is the gauge that you are testing you can see here that they have the PSI's here uh, this is the valve that you, you open and close to uh, connect the test gauge to your system and in here you can see the weights and this is the piston now in order to reduce friction in the piston which uh, would be created here now typically those weights are rotating because uh, there is obviously a trade-off here I have a piston in a cylinder but uh, I need to reduce the friction between the piston and the cylinder because uh, if uh, this connection this seal is very tight that's fine I will not have any fluid that can escape like that but on the other hand if uh, this uh, has a high motion resistance it will not react very well to changes of weight or changes of F so it's a trade-off so in order to reduce the friction now this platform including the weights is rotating so then here you have uh, reduced friction in the vertical direction so if you take a look on some of the videos that I have linked here then uh, you will see that uh, they turn it on they rotate manually those uh, weights with the piston and then they read the numbers from the gauges and uh, this is the pump uh, that uh, is used to manually pump the oil and uh, to get a specific pressure uh, in the oil now what can you expect the that way tester works in a fairly large range of pressures so uh, you can use it to calibrate hydraulic systems hydraulic gauges and so on um, th those numbers that you can see here are numbers from some of those uh, dead weight testers that you can see here so uh, very large pressures so 200 megapascals not a problem uh, at all uh, on the other hand it does not start from low pressures so not from zero because there it would be quite inaccurate so typically it starts from something like uh, 100 kilopascals and then it's uh, above uh, this given pressure uh, you can see there are many versions it can look like this look like that uh, in all cases uh, you have some weights here some piston in there and uh, some pump mechanism so here you can see okay they're pumping that uh, with the lever uh, with some mechanism you're pumping this up and down and you're increasing the pressure and uh, then uh, there will be some uh, connection for your gauge so in this case it is for example here this is uh, where you have some thread connection uh, to help to connect uh, your measure uh, to, to, to connect your gauge that you are currently testing now the dead weight tester is uh, a quite expensive device so it is again not an industrial grade system that you would use somewhere in uh, some process industry you use it in a lab to calibrate your gauges so typically it's something like 10,000 US dollars so it's quite expensive on the other hand you can see accuracy is very good so point 0.01, 0.02% of reading within this range. We will see next week that uh, in the case of industrial gauges, we will be at least uh, one order of magnitude worse with accuracy. 
so industrial gauges may have something like 0.5 percent or 1 percent or maybe even 5 percent dependent on what type do you actually use the last one that uh, we could call a calibration gauge is uh, a gauge that is based on liquid column I'm sure that you have already seen this type of uh, manometers, maybe in some fluid uh, mechanics lab, for example. Uh, it is a fairly simple device. Uh, you can build yourself one at home uh, if you need to measure some, some pressure for, I don't know, for, for some air, for example. It's called a YouTube manometer. It's using the, uh, the liquid column definition and uh, we can calculate what is the pressure difference so it's a u-tube shaped piece of uh, a tube it can be glass can be plastics doesn't really matter what whatever you use and uh, it measures pressure difference so I have pressure P1 and pressure P2 now this will give me some pressure difference if uh, P1 is larger than P2 then I will have some height 1 and height 2 in my tube there is a scale behind this tube so I can read uh, what is uh, the height difference so uh, I can calculate that uh, the pressure difference is equal to basically some constant times h now this should be this should that yeah, is this is this is correct this should be h or h is h1 plus h2 uh, the constant is given by gravitational acceleration and uh, by the difference in densities uh, in most cases row one this is air and the row to for example water or, or mercury so you can safely neglect uh, the density of air compared to uh, to water because it's uh, like three orders of magnitude smaller so it's density times gravitational acceleration times h so fairly simple uh, and uh, quite useful for simple experiments now the used liquids are either water, mercury, or alcohol. The advantage of mercury is that uh, it has a fairly high density, and uh, for this reason, it will give you small height compared to water, for example. Well, although it's toxic, then it will give you, let's say, about 13 times smaller dimensions of your meter than if it would be with water or alcohol uh, how to read it correctly well uh, you need to uh, avoid two errors uh, that uh, you may do in reading such a liquid uh, level based uh, manometer uh, surface tension in water creates a shape like that and uh, you need to read this bottom dimension this bottom coordinate uh, surface tension in mercury will create a shape like this and you need to read the top the second problem that uh, you may create by reading is the so-called parallax error and it means that you need to read in the perpendicular direction like that and not like this or not like that so this is wrong and you should always read it in the perpendicular direction now uh, this applies not only to the YouTube manometer but also to other liquid based type manometers here you see few examples of uh, the YouTube manometers uh, so basically it's a tube like that bent in the form of letter U you can see here the scale and I can read the difference uh, in height uh, on this picture you can see also the surface tension so um, this is either alcohol or uh, 
water with some added uh, green colorant and uh, I would read this from the bottom and this from the bottom and this would give me uh, this is my height difference and uh, I could read uh, what is the pressure so now this is good uh, if you want to read relatively small pressure differences because uh, otherwise you would have a very large uh, instrument uh, larger than a few meters and it would be very impractical so those instruments are still used they are used uh, to show some basic data uh, they do not have any electrical output but uh, they are fairly reliable and uh, fairly good curious uh, the last type that I will cover today is uh, also a liquid based instrument it is called a well type manometer or it's called also a barometer because uh, it is uh, fairly often used to measure barometric pressure we have a tank with uh, the liquid and we have a pipe with the liquid now we measure the pressure difference between P2 and P1 so this measures again uh, the pressure difference if P1 now is larger than P2 it will compress this this, this area the pressure is going in and uh, the liquid level in my tank will decrease slightly by H1 and this volume will then go into the pipe like this and uh, I will call that H2 now for simplicity let's assume that uh, the diameter of uh, my tank here is much larger than the diameter of my tube under this assumption I can say okay the decrease in liquid level H1 will be much smaller than the increase in H2 in other words here the decrease will not be that significant so there is a relation between H2 and the pressure difference that I measure it is given by those equations which again we don't need to remember but at the end it will be a linear equation so it is H2 what I read from some scale on the tube times constant and a constant is uh, given by the densities by gravitational force and uh, by something that's called a conversion factor and this is uh, the relation between the two cross sections of uh, my pipe here and uh, my tank over there so we can see that this will be a constant number as well uh, I'm assuming that uh, it's not changing the diameter of the tube and the diameter of my pipe so it's a fairly linear device I can read simply again H and uh, I can get the, uh, the pressure this is how it looks like so it's a pipe on the bottom you have a tank with liquid somewhere uh, now if you use water as a liquid inside you are basically limited to about 3 kilopascals of pressure now remember the units when we start started with the pressure now 3 kilopascals is approximately uh, 3 meters of uh, water column so this is uh, a practical limitation well maybe not 3 meters but maybe something like 1 or 2, 1, 1 1.5 meters because otherwise uh, you would have a very large column very, very long tube and uh, you would need a ladder to, to to, to see the, the reading 
Uh, on the other hand, we know that it's quite possible to measure within one millimeter approximately the height. So uh, this will give us about one percent of uh, the accuracy. Okay, uh, the very last thing is that we can incline the tube and uh, we can increase our accuracy uh, for smaller pressures. So now what I've done is nothing else that I have inclined the tube by some angle alpha over there. So it's working in exactly the same way. I will read H2 and H2 times some constant will give me the pressure. Uh, but now since um, this is inclined, obviously uh, this will be sensitive for lower pressures because I will have the same H uh, for lower value of, uh, of delta P. So the equation is the same at the end. It's some constant times the length that you read. But uh, under this uh, value of uh, the conversion factor, you can find the sine of alpha. Previously, our alpha was 90 degrees. So uh, here we had we have one but if I am inclining that uh, this will increase my sensitivity so the instrument at the end you find that if you incline that under this angle the conversion factor is some number if you incline it with some other angle it's a different conversion factor now uh, this is uh, an instrument that has a smaller range because I want that it has a better resolution for smaller pressures. The accuracy is about the same. You can see here different uh, different versions. Uh, I think that this one is, uh, is quite interesting because in this section you can see this is the inclined section from 0 to 200 pascals and uh, then this is the vertical section, the non-inclined and uh, they say that it has uh, from starts from 200 pascals and it goes up to 600 pascals over there. So for smaller pressures, I have a larger sensitivity on this area, and for higher pressures, I have um, larger range like that. I have uh, lower sensitivity. So that's all for today, and uh, next week we'll be talking about deformation manometers those are the ones that are used in industrial systems so see you next week